Uh, don't send out for pizza. Come to the church and enjoy the Seder dinner. Learn about Christ and the Passover, and then have a nice meal here at the church. April 26th. Tickets go on sale next week at $12.50 apiece. Secondly of all, this past week I received a phone call. It actually came in on Tuesday late afternoon from Memphis, Tennessee. And this phone call said, Pastor Joel, the Blackwood Quartet is traveling from somewhere in the east back to Memphis, and on Sunday, April the 6th, that's next week, they would like to do a concert at your church Sunday night. Would you be receptive to that? And we said, sure. So next Sunday night, April 6th at 6 o'clock, the Blackwood Quartet will be here for one performance only. They're on their way back home. Sunday, April 6th. Next Sunday night, 6 o'clock, the Blackwood Quartet. We haven't really had time to announce it or send news releases out like we normally do, of course. We just got that information ourselves. So keep it in mind. Plan to come and invite others with you next Sunday night. If you're a guest today, we welcome you. Thank you for coming. We trust the Lord will bless you as we worship together. We do have a guest information packet we like to make available to our friends. It comes with a pin that is yours to keep. Fill out the card that comes with it later in our service. Put it in the offering plate. We will send you further information on our church. Let us pray and enter into the worship of God. Lord, today we are grateful to be here. We gather in the name of Jesus, our Savior, with the prayer that you will reward our faith. We know that the weather today is not accommodating. Many of us probably would have preferred just staying in, maybe even pulling the covers up over our heads, but we are here because we desire to be touched by your spirit, to be blessed by you, to be encouraged by one another, and to go out of this place a better person than when we entered. To this end, we ask you to bless our faith today, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you are a guest and you want our guest information packet, during this time of greeting, you remain seated. The rest of us, let's stand, greet one another, and welcome each other to the chapel. Good morning, everyone. I invite you to join us in worship. Uh, Lord, we just want to thank you for this time. We uh, come together to lift you up and bring you praise in Jesus' name. will reign forever and all the world will know his name everyone together 
and sing the song of the redeemed. I know that my Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what He did. My Savior, my Savior lives. And every day, every day a brand new chance to say, Jesus, you are the only way. My Savior, my Savior lives. The King has come from heaven. And darkness trembles at his name. Victory forever is the song of the redeemed. I know that my Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what he did. My Savior, my Savior lives. Every day a brand new chance to say, Jesus, you are the only way. My Savior, my Savior lives. My Savior lives, my Savior lives, my Savior lives. My Savior lives, my Savior lives, my Savior lives. Did my Savior, my Savior lives. Every day a brand new chance to say, Jesus, you are the only way. My Savior, my Savior lives. And I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. And now I stand on what he did. My Savior, my Savior lives. Every day a brand new chance to say, Jesus, you are the only way. My Savior, my Savior lives. Search my heart and search my soul. There's nothing else that I want more. And shine your light and show your face. In 
in my life, Lord, have your way, have your way. Hear my cry and hear my prayer. Draw me close, I know you're near. And give me strength and give me grace. To walk with you, Lord, all my days, and with all my heart. So with all my heart and all my soul, with all I am, Lord, I will follow. Restore my life Now I live to worship you And search my heart And search my heart And search my soul There's nothing else that I want more with all my heart. So with all my heart and all my soul, with all I am, Lord, I will follow you. You took the cross. You took my shame, restored my life, now I live to worship you. Without you, I am nothing. 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 So with all my heart and all my soul, with all I am, Lord, I will follow you. You took the cross. You took my shame, restored my life, Lord, I live to worship you. Without you, I am nothing. 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 And search my heart and search my soul. Um, I know Pastor Joel mentioned something about the weather today, and it. Uh, 
brought to mind last night I went down to um, or yesterday I was down in the Amish country area I got to see the Stockdale family band down in uh, Walnut Creek and uh, the drive back home was uh, quite interesting the roads got quite slick and everything so I get in my car and I'm about to head back with Angela and Tabor and back and start driving a little bit and a couple lights blink on my dashboard saying that my vehicle stability control and my power steering are no longer working. And so I'm thinking, oh great, my car's failing me. So I'm going through this and uh, it brought to mind as I was thinking about uh, just the upcoming weeks leading towards Easter of how, um, how the disciples probably felt leading up through uh, Good Friday and everything of their, their savior, the person they see as the ruler of the world, is arrested and taken to court and sentenced to death and died and they're thinking like wow this whatever we thought this is failing us whatever we're trying to do on our own power whatever we think we have going on it's it's failing us um and i, I was just encouraged to think that it's three days later he rose again whatever you're going through on your own whatever trials that you may feel that god's not with you anymore that he's failing you He's leading you through it, and there will be better at the end. Um, and the disciples are thinking, like, wow, this is over. He's dead, right? But no, that was just the beginning. He had to do that to, to conquer death and to prove victory over it. Um, so uh, this next song, Jesus Paid It All, just really, uh, I encourage you to think about that hearing it. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I own. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed you white as snow. Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all, all to him my own, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. snow. Who paid my debt and raised the 
his life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And for my part in this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow, that makes me white as snow No other found I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus And hallelujah, what a Savior Hallelujah, what a friend Hallelujah for the precious that covers all my sin and hallelujah he is risen and the grave is not the end and hallelujah for the blood of jesus and this is all my hope and peace Nothing but the blood of Jesus This is all my righteousness Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, 
precious is the flow that makes me why as so no other found I know nothing but the blood of Jesus and oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other bound i know nothing but the blood of jesus and hallelujah hallelujah what a savior hallelujah what a friend That covers all my sin. And hallelujah is risen, and the grave is not the end. Hallelujah for the blood of Jesus. can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus you may be seated well there it goes again I may need a Thank you, Matt. I'll just uh, take a moment here and remove this. Excuse me for the inconvenience. Sometimes the way it goes. I wanted to encourage you this morning. Next Sunday is our tithing demonstration day, and we're asking everyone to give a tithe to show how much we could give together as a church if we tithe, but also to overcome some of the problems that the weather has caused not only for our church but every other church that I know of as well as a lot of businesses around the weather has kept people in and consequently uh, the economy is down a little and giving is down in churches including ours so we're asking next Sunday that you give a tithe tithing demonstration Sunday now here's the encouragement just this week last week just last week on one of the mornings Todd Hosteller knocked on my door and came in I think it was Thursday morning and he said Pastor Joel you'll want to hear this now Todd is an individual our middle school and sports pastor he goes to Marlington Middle School usually once a week and has lunch there in the cafeteria and he said I was over at Marlington School and he didn't say when but recently and the Dean of Students, and he mentioned her name, but I, at the moment, cannot recollect it. But the Dean of Students called him into her office and said, Todd, whatever you're doing out there at the chapel in Marlboro, keep on doing it. We see a difference in the kids here at the school who attend your church. We see the difference. Their attitude, their behavior, their study habit, everything about them sets them apart from the rest of the children here in the middle school so Todd whatever you guys are doing out there at the chapel keep on doing it because it works we can see it in the lives of our kids isn't that great yeah so I just want to share that and say we thank God for our Sunday school teachers for our jam teachers for our youth workers for our adult teachers, for everyone who's involved in the church, we are making a difference in the community. We are making a difference in the lives of our kids and hopefully in the lives of adults as well. 
So thank you for all that you do to help us be effective in presenting Christ to the world. The offering that we receive today is for the ministry that God has given us together here at the chapel. Thank you for your faithfulness in the giving of tithes and of offerings. Shall we pray? Dear Father, we are grateful for these words that come occasionally reminding us that we are making a difference in the lives of people, in homes, in the community, that Christ is being seen that ministry is being effective. We are grateful, and as grateful people we give today with a prayer that you will bless these gifts and those who give them. And this I ask in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Thank you for your gift this morning. Now don't run off. This is Krista Mattern and this is Jenna Hoffman. Thank you girls for your duet this morning. Our scripture reading is found from the Gospel of John chapter 1. For those of you who may have forgotten or who may be new and not realize it, we are going through the Gospel of John together. And this morning we'll be reading verses 35 to 37, a brief reading. But if you would stand please for the reading of God's word from the Gospel of John chapter 1. Again the next day, Jesus stood with two of his disciples and looking at John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Thank you. You may be seated. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his own holy word. Those three verses of scripture collectively comprise a powerful thought. And we're going to break those thoughts down, but we're going to start with that phrase in verse 37, they followed Jesus. The world of unbelievers are the ones who gave us the name Christians. It was not a self-appointed name. They were called Christians first at Antioch. They didn't choose to call themselves that. Others called them that. The phrase, the word, actually means Christ's ones or Christ's follower. And we see in this verse of scripture that some of John's disciples chose to follow Christ. Today I want to challenge you to be a Christ follower. 
In our theology, we talk about the fall of man. We know that that topic takes us back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. In the fall of man, we think a lot of the mind, how it has become corrupted. The spirit, how it has become alienated, foreign to God. And the soul, the seat of our emotions, how they have become jaded and and warped. Prior to that, Adam and Eve were created and placed in a perfect environment, the Garden of Eden. And it is there that we find them in purposeful living. They knew when they were in that perfect environment of Eden, in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, was there with them, speaking to them, fellowshipping with them. They knew that they were there with a purpose, and that was to be in the presence of God, to know him, to worship him, to love him, to serve him, and in return to have him love them. That was their purpose. They were created to know God, to love God, to serve God. And while there are a lot of implications and repercussions involving the fall, and I've commented on those briefly a moment ago, that which seems to be most lost as a result of their sin and the rebellion against God and their expulsion from the garden was their sense of purpose. Why am I here? Why is the reason that human beings live what is that reason? Why am I here? What is my purpose in living? What is my destiny? Why was I ever born? A sense of purpose lost. As soon as they left that garden environment and stepped out into a world that now was under the curse of sin, a curse pronounced by God, as soon as they stepped out into that world, they began losing their identity and their sense of purpose. Jesus calls this status of mankind being lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost, who don't know why they were created, why they were born, why they're here, or where they're going. But he came to seek and to save those who are lost. One of the more interesting stories in the Old Testament, in my estimation, surrounds the life of Moses. It's an event from the life of Moses. I think it's an episode that clearly speaks to us of Man trying to reconnect seems to be a phrase that I read today in journals and articles. I don't read it in some of the classical books, but man trying to rediscover is the word I would use. Rediscover his purpose. And Moses, a man who had intimate encounters with God, who had heard the voice of Jesus speaking to him, the literal voice in the burning bush, and then had met with Christ on Mount Sinai, even Moses, in his quest to rediscover himself and his purpose and the reason for his existence, says to God in chapter 33 of Exodus, will you show me your glory? Just show me a little bit of your perfect character. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. A character without blemish, a character without flaws, a perfect character. Can you imagine? It's hard for us, maybe impossible for us to imagine, because our character is flawed. 
Yes, we may be in the company of the redeemed. We may be a child of God. But still, as long as we are in this body, we will express a sin nature occasionally. Our natures are flawed and must be redeemed. And that final redemption takes place in the resurrection when we have a new body. But be that as it may, Moses says, show me your glory. Show me that perfect character, flawless and unblemished character of God. And God says, I cannot do that, Moses. No man can see my glory and survive. But I will show you my goodness. And here is what happens. At the end of chapter 33 of Exodus, the Lord speaks to Moses and says, I will do what you have asked, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. That phrase means, I know you well. I don't just have a passing acquaintance. We might read that in English and think it's just a passing acquaintance. When God says, I know you by name, that means I know your heart. I know you. I know everything about you. I know what, what is in your heart of hearts. And I wonder, have you found God's grace through Jesus Christ? If so, then you're his child, and he knows your heart. So I will do this thing that you have spoken, for I have found gra you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And Moses said, please show me your glory. And God said, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And there again, when he says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, it means I will show you my essential being, my character. When in the Old Testament culture, a child was born, parents would look at that child for a few days before naming that child. And then they would give it a name that they seemed to sense fit the character of the child. Now, sometimes they were wrong. Usually they were right, but sometimes they were wrong. And when the child got older and people saw his character was not what the parents thought, it'd get another name that expressed who he was. But God says, I will show you my name. I will show you my character. I will show you what I am like. But you must hide in the cleft of the rock when I pass by. So Moses does that, and the day of the event comes. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord, his character. And the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful. Mercy in the Old Testament equates to grace in the New. Mercy and grace go together, like two peas in the same pod. To del delineate between the two, though, mercy is a sense of compassion sympathy for the sinner in his misery. Grace is the activity whereby rescue is offered to the sinner from his misery. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering patient, abounding in goodness and truth. We'll never know what goodness is unless God tells us. We'll never know what truth is unless God tells us. He defines those terms for us. Abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty. He is a just God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So Moses bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Now the reason that stands as one of the gr 
unusual and interesting events of the Old Testament to me is here's Moses who had been in the presence of God, who had seen God, who had worshipped God, seen God in outline form, worshipped God in his very presence to whom God had spoken and God had given the law and still Moses is saying help me to understand you. And God says okay I want you to know me. I want you to understand me. All that your father Adam lost in the garden, that knowledge of me, of my mercy, of my grace, of my, and so on, my goodness, I realize you want to know and you need to experience. So I will show you my goodness. Isn't that still the craving of our hearts, really? When we take the time from the busyness of life to think about ourselves, our needs, and God, isn't it really our craving to say, I want to know the goodness of God. I want to know the goodness of God in a world of sin. I want to know the goodness of God amongst the despair of people. I want to know the goodness of God. I want that goodness to be part of my life. I want that goodness to shine upon me. I want that goodness to be my experience. That goodness comes when we rediscover that our purpose is to know God, to worship Him, to love Him, and to be loved by Him, and then to serve Him. Just as Adam was in the garden and lost that understanding of purpose. Jesus comes so that we might know it, so that we might know that God who made us and we might rediscover our purpose in living is to know him, love him, serve him, and be loved in return by him. Here is a passage of scripture where we begin with John the Baptist. John the Baptist, and I've got a graphic up there of John. There he is, good old John the Baptist. John the Baptist had an unusual wardrobe, didn't he? It's even specified in the New Testament. You know why it was specified? Because it was the same thing that Elijah wore. Same wardrobe, same outfit that Elijah wore. Elijah in 1 Kings 17, the prophet called by God to go down and tell Ahab, you better shape up or the judgment of God is going to fall upon you and this nation. Elijah had come from the mountainous area of Tishba. Elijah, the Tishbite. This was the kind of wardrobe he wore. It wasn't the clothing of royalty. It wasn't even the clothing of the priests. It was the clothing of a rough-hewn prophet. But the Old Testament had closed in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, with a promise that when the Messiah is to come, Elijah the prophet will come just before him and announce his coming. And so here he is. Jesus was later to say, in the spirit of Elijah, John the Baptist preached, with the same attitude, with the same message, with the same demeanor, even with the same clothing. Here he is in the spirit and power of Elijah, proclaiming that the Messiah is here. He's about to make his appearance. And so people flocked. People flocked to hear. There had not been a prophet for 400 years. This was the last of the Old Testament prophets. There had not been one for 400 years, and the people were hungry for a message from God. They wanted to rediscover God. Enough of their rituals, enough of their religion. They wanted an experience with God. John the Baptist 
promised it. He is here, and he will make his appearance soon. And then the day comes when Jesus steps forth to begin his public ministry, and John the Baptist points him out, and he says, Here he is! Here's the one I've been preaching about. Here's the one I've been telling you about. Here's the Messiah. Here's the Savior. And then two of his disciples leave and begin following Jesus. Following Jesus because he's the Messiah. Following Jesus because they know that he will teach them what it means to know God, to love God, to worship God, to serve God, to be loved by God and to be in fellowship with him, their original purpose. Look, here's the point I'm trying to get across today. I'll make it at the end. I'll make it now. You were made for a purpose. And you will only find that purpose by following Jesus. All of the saints, from the beginning of time, I suppose, certainly through the Old Testament era, even unto today, have the same sort of craving. Psalm 42 expresses it as the deer pants for the water so my soul pants for thee so my soul craves God to be in the presence of God to know that God's presence is real to me to be able to experience him and know him to be able to worship him and serve him to know that I am the object of his love and his care those things that Adam lost or the things we desire most because that's why we are created I like to walk my little dog in the morning <laughs> Lulu we gave her that name because she really is a Lulu she's mixed breed she's got some basset hound in her and she's built like a tank and I put a harness on her when we walk and sometimes when that basset hound instinct kicks in and she wants to hunt, she picks up a scent and wants to hunt, that, that harness harnesses all of her strength as well as her body. And so we'll be walking along. And prior to Lulu, I had a lazy old collie that I'd walk. And she would just lollygag along, and I'd lollygag with her. And now that I've got this dog, once in a while she'll bolt. And out I go. So yesterday morning we were walking down Malo Path and all of a sudden five deer went running across the road in front of us and there she went. When I first got the dog I didn't expect that. And after about two weeks, man, my, the muscles around my rib cage were so sore. I had to transfer from one hand to the other and then those muscles got sore too. But now I'm in shape, I'm ready for it. So at any rate, we saw those deer cross the road, and they just kind of lumbered across the road, and wham, out she goes, and they saw her, and they took off running. And probably about 150 yards from us, they stopped and they looked. And the thought crossed my mind, if they would keep running like that, they would soon be panting for water. And in the race of life, it's called a race in Hebrews chapter 12. In the race of life, we begin to pant. Our souls pant for God. We crave God. To know God. To know that God knows us. To love God. To know that God loves us. To serve God. This is why we were made. Robert Murray McChain was a preacher from Scotland in the 18th century. Had an interesting episode in his life. I just read about this week. 
McChain had a pastor friend from Scotland who had been studying German. Now, if you've ever studied a foreign language, and I'm sure most of you have, you know that when you're in a classroom setting and a, you're just learning from books, it becomes very stilted. You learn a few phrases and you say them awkwardly, and if you're overseas, as I have been, and use them, as I have done, the nationals always go because it's such a stilted way of speaking. So his friend, wanting to learn German, went to Germany to study, and McChain wrote this letter to him. He says, I know you will apply yourself hard to learn German, but do not forget the culture of the inner man, I mean of the heart. I want to paraphrase McChain's letter for just a moment. I know you will apply yourself hard to be the best employee you can be, but don't forget the culture of the inner man. I know you will apply yourself hard to be the best employer you can be, but don't forget the culture of the inner man. I know you will apply yourself hard to be a good husband, to be a good wife, to be an obedient child, but don't forget the culture of the inner man. Don't forget the culture of the heart. Don't forget as you are learning German. Don't forget as you are learning machining. Don't forget as you are learning to be a pastor or a school teacher. Don't forget as you are taking care of the children at home and packing their lunches and getting them ready for school. Don't forget to take care of your heart. Keep your heart close to God. Don't forget the culture of the inner man. I mean of the heart. How diligently the cavalry officer keeps his saber clean. I have a saber and a sheath. How diligently the cavalry officer keeps his saber clean and sharp. Every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. Remember that you are God's sword. You are his instrument. And you are. In this world where people are lost, they don't know their purpose, they don't know the meaning of life, they don't know why they're here, they don't know where they're going, they don't know what their destiny is, and desperately would they like to know, you are an instrument in God's hand. Don't forget that you are God's sword, his instrument. I trust a chosen vessel to bear his name in great measure according to the purity and perfection of the instrument will be the success. In great measure, according to your degree of commitment to Jesus will be your success in life, will be your happiness in life, will be your joy in great degree, according to your level of commitment, you will find your purpose. You will rediscover why God made you in his image, why God put the first pair in the Garden of Eden where they fellowshiped and worshiped him because you were made to fellowship and worship with him. And then this phrase. I use a red pencil when I study the Bible and when I make sermons and I write down things and if it's something that I really want to share I take that red pencil and boy I color that phrase in. This is red penciled which means if you hear nothing else this morning will you hear this please from Robert Murray McChain. It is not great talents that God blesses so much as likeness to Jesus. It is not great talents that God blesses so much as likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. It is not great talents that God blesses so much as likeness to Jesus. So how are you going to be like Jesus? How are you going to learn? By following him. Peter puts it this way. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. 
He says, for to this you were called, verse 21, 1 Peter 2, 21, for to this you were called, meaning this is the reason you're here. For to this you were called. Christ, having left us an example that you should follow in his steps. Isn't that great? You are to be a Christian. Christ's one. A Christ follower. For this reason you were called, that you might follow in his steps. God wants you to be a little Christ. So, how do we get there? A couple of thoughts, and then we'll close. First of all, decide today you're going to be a learner. Learning is lifelong. should be. Let's appreciate learning. Let's try to learn. Read a little bit from the Gospels every day. Those tell us about Jesus. Those tell us what Jesus was like. Those tell us what what Jesus did. The Gospels share with us Jesus' teaching. You don't have to read through all four Gospels in one day. Read two chapters a day. Begin with Mark. It's the shortest. And as you read... Don't just do it to say, boy, I got my scripture reading done today. Now I can go on and live life. But as you read, ask yourself and then answer to your satisfaction, what is Jesus teaching me here? What can I learn from the life of Jesus? What attitude does Jesus show? What compassion does he have? What does he do to help people? He just doesn't pass by people who beg him for help. Lord, I'm blind. Help me to see. He helps them. He speaks to them. Of course, he's the Messiah and has divine power. He can heal them. I can't. I've always wondered about these faith healers, haven't you? Why don't they go to the hospital and just heal them all and send them home? Well, That's another subject for another time. But Jesus is the Messiah. He can do those things. I can't. But I can help and I can bless and I can encourage. So what am I learning as I read these two chapters from Mark or Matthew or Luke or John today? What is Jesus teaching me? How can I be more like Jesus today? And then go to an epistle, because the epistles teach us how to live as Christ followers in a fallen world. The Gospels teach us about Jesus, the Messiah, what he taught, what he was like, his character, and so on. But the epistles say, hey, you, you, the fallen man who has now been redeemed by Jesus, You, the one who has come by faith to the cross and believed in Jesus and received the Holy Spirit into your spirit to empower you, here's how you can live that empowered life. Now do this. So learn. Be a learner. Number two. Our need is to recognize Jesus and follow him. Number two is our genuine success as persons depends on the degree to which we follow Jesus. I've already made that clear, I think. We all want to be successful in life. So why do we fail so often? Because we don't know our purpose. We don't know why we were made. We don't know why we were born. We don't know why we exist. We don't know why we're here in this world. I'm here to make money. Is that it? Someday you're going to leave it. I'm here to get married and have a family. Is that it? Someday the kids will leave the house. Someday you'll depart from this world and enter the next. Your ultimate purpose is to know God through Jesus Christ love him, to worship him, to serve him, and to enjoy him forever. Forever begins now, not in heaven. It continues in heaven. So number one, be a learner. Recognize who Jesus is. Decide you're going to follow him. Number two, 
Realize that your success as a person depends on rediscovering your purpose and living it. And then number three, be vigorous at following Christ. I got this idea, not all three, but the last one from reading a sermon by Charles Haddon Spurgeon this week. Spurgeon was one of the great preachers. Some consider him the greatest thing, uh, preacher of the English-speaking world, perhaps. I don't know. But he was a good one. And he pastored in London during the time of the American Civil War as sermons were captured by a stenographer and printed. So we have them. In one of his sermons, Spurgeon gives this illustration. It's on being vigorous in following Christ. At that time, people traveled by train, and there were smaller trains, not huge locomotives, but small trains, putt-putt trains, we might call them, who took them from one little town to the other in England. And he said that one day he was on a train going from Perth to Edinburgh, going from one preaching assignment to another. And it was a two-piston engine that was pulling along the train full of passengers when one of the pistons gave out. And instead of humming along at whatever speed they were supposed to go, the train's ability to operate was cut by more than half. And they just very slowly made the journey and finally arrived at their destination hours late. Spurgeon was intrigued as to what had gone wrong and the next day went down and asked someone who knew what had happened. He said when a mechanic got in there and looked, the reason one of the pistons quit was because a screw had gotten loose and had fallen out. And just that one little screw had caused one of the pistons to give out and the train to be hampered in its journey. Spurgeon says, we must be vigorous in following Christ. Because if there's one area of our life that is not brought under the Lordship of Jesus, if there's one area of our life, even if it's a small area that we say, I'm going to keep this to myself, rather than giving it to God, then it will hamper us in our enjoyment of God and in our witness to the world. Friends, following Jesus helps you to discover who you really are, brings you to a place of fellowship and purpose and joy in your relationship with God, makes you effective in your service. Follow him. Let us pray. And as we go to prayer this morning, Perhaps there are friends here who have not yet made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. We would not want to close the service without giving you an opportunity to invite Christ by faith into your life. This morning we've talked about following Jesus as a way of rediscovering who you really are and your purpose in life. Last week I commented that the larger catechism answers it this way. The chief end, that is the purpose of life is to know God and enjoy him forever. Do you know God? Are you enjoying him? You know God through Jesus Christ. You enjoy him by following Christ. Dear Father, I pray today that as we bring our service to a close, that all of us will come to a place where we are vigorous in following Christ, that we have understood our need, that we desire to be learners, and to apply those lessons to life. That we realize that our success in living in this world under the curse of sin and a world of darkness comes through following Jesus. I pray that as a church we will point people to Jesus the same way John the Baptist did. I pray that if there are friends here today who know not Jesus, that they will find him. And I also pray that if there are friends here today who know Christ and would like to become part of our church family, that they will feel the freedom to express that desire. And I pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let us stand together as we sing, and if you'd care to respond this morning, you come. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Well, please don't forget that next week our tickets for the Seder will go on sale and we encourage you to buy one and come. And that also next Sunday night, this has not been announced until today, nor has it been advertised, but next Sunday night at 6 o'clock, the Blackwood Quartet will be here in concert. These are excellent singers, and they do songs that you'll enjoy. Between now and next Sunday, invite someone to church with you. They'll appreciate the invitation. Let us pray. Lord, the world calls us Christian. And the reason they do that is because the earliest people followed Christ with all their heart, soul, and strength. May we be worthy of that title. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father, and may the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all till our Savior come and evermore. Amen.